When I first heard about this conference of science meeting uh, spirituality, I thought of the Higgs boson particle. Um, two things, I realize I oversimplified the conference, uh, but I'm, that's the first thing I thought of, was the Higgs boson particle, and also, AKA the God particle, and I was surprised it wasn't mentioned. I don't know who to address this question to, but does anyone want to bring that into the conversation? I don't know if anybody else wants to, but I know from a Catholic priest perspective, it's a very unfortunately named reality, is that's the best answer I can give. I actually know the origin of that. That, that was a misquote. They actually called it the goddamn particle. Uh, seriously. Um, and somebody was trying to clean up that quote and put the damn part out. Um, yeah. So, so I know a lot about the Higgs boson. Um, I, 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 am, I, I, I lead, I lead uh, uh, tours of CERN, the, uh, the, the big uh, collider that found the Higgs boson in Switzerland and France. I, I do that for the Smithsonian. It's the particle that's responsible for what we think of as mass. So, so basically, to think of it as a particle is not the right way. It's a field that, that particles interact with, and they either have mass or they don't. Like light has no mass. Light is pure energy. A proton and you know, neutrons that I'm made of have the ability to bend space and time. And that's what a Higgs boson is. It's what gives something mass. Um, physicists, and, and I, I, I do believe, you know, physicists don't ascribe anything supernatural to it, anything to do with God. I think, you know, Father James and I have sort of talked about this, that it, it's, I think it's misguided to look for physical proof of God. I, I think that's a different part of, of being human. You know, because the natural world, people have ascribed many things to deities. And we understand now, I mean, it, it, it was never the case that, oh, we, we understand everything else but thunder, that was Thor. That really is a God, right? I mean, I mean as we explore things that are unknown, just because they're unknown doesn't mean they're proof of God. tiny particle that uh, is all pervasive. Not that it is God, but right. that it is more pervasive. It's a field that exists throughout the universe. Particles interact with it differently, and as particles interact with it, they acquire what we think of as mass, what we define as as mass. So some particles interact with the Higgs field, some, some don't. But it, it was a tremendous discovery, because we'd never really we, we, had, we had theoretically posited there must be a field that everything interacts with that, that, that creates what we think of as mass. And you, you notice I keep saying what we think of as mass. Um, some particles really do seem to pop up into different dimensions. I mean, that's the way Einstein described it, that you bend up into space and time. That's what, that's what the property of mass is. And the incredible thing is, you know Einstein's equations, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So you were made of, I mean, you can be converted back into light, you can be converted back into pure energy through that equation. So in some ways, you know, that's a really amazing thing that we're all sort of coagulated pure energy and, and the Higgs boson is the particle that moderates that. Um, if you think that the universe is, is all understood, one of the things that really gets me, this is true, is that when you're traveling on a photon, when you're traveling at the speed of light, space and time become a single thing. A photon does not experience time, time stops. So a photon can travel the entirety of the universe in zero time, according to it, according to its perspective. And every point in space collapses into a single reality for a photon. This is physics. This is, not, this, is, this is actually Einstein. These are the current laws of physics. So when you think that there's a beam of light that's, that's intersecting with my eye and my eye is responding to it, that's not the way the light sees it at all. The light sees all of space and time as one thing. And we're surrounded by stuff that does not experience reality the way we do. It's simple as light. I, th I think that I am closer to experiencing everything like light <laughs> from the point of view of light. Hi, my, my name is Judy. And I, I have a question that's a, a little bit of a shift. When one thinks of heaven, whether it's the physical heaven or the spiritual one, there's a connection to it, which is death. Now, I don't, I don't want to talk about death in and of itself, but how does the understanding that we are stardust 
inform our fear or understanding of what happens when we, we die. And I say that in light of the fact that this is a human universal fear, and I'm wondering if it's something we should fear. D did I articulate my question well enough? Okay, thank you. I have to actually go over here. Um, I found two books um, of recently. I used to be the only woman on Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's board of directors. She was a triplet, a medical doctor from Switzerland, who was very nuts and bolts doctor for years, until she had a patient who became clinically dead like six times and then would come back. And it was so strange for her with her good Swiss kind of, you know, on time clock running kind of personality. She said, well, what's keeping you here? You know, like, why do you keep, you're, like, I've never met anyone like you who keeps on, you know, being clinically dead and reviving, clinically dead reviving. She said, well, I'm so worried about my son. I, I just don't know what will happen with him. She said, well, would you like to die? And she said, I really would, but I'm just so darn, you know, focused on my son, you know. And she, it, it pro pronounced, so she progressed and she got to know the son as, and said, look, I know the things you're worried about. You've explained them. I promise you that I will give support and I will make a network of support around your son. I, I, I swear this to be true to you. And the next time, the woman passed over. But she was such a powerful force. When long after she was dead, she appeared like bodily, long buried, but reconstituted and saw, shown herself to Elizabeth. And this blew Elizabeth's mind so profoundly that uh, you know she did many other things. You know she brought compassion to you know hospice to America. When I was growing up, if your mom was dying of uh, you know breast cancer and you weren't 12 years old, you know the limit for being able to go up into the room to see your mom, your mom wasn't going to see you if she was going to die in that hospital of breast cancer, and you were never going to be able to kiss her goodbye or anything. So she brought a level of compassion, but it really revolutionized her 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 thinking. But there's two books um, that I came across, uh, both written uh, by physicians, and one is a, neuro, uh, is a neurosurgeon, and I think they're worth uh, reading. His name is Eben Alexander. Does anyone know that book? And it's called um, Proof of Heaven. And it was a guy who really didn't believe in anything like, you're dead, you're dead, he's what he thought, you know? And then the other is really beautiful. It's called Seven Lessons from Heaven, How Dying Taught Me uh, to Live a Life, uh, a Joy-Filled Life. And that's by Mary C. Neal. And she also is, um, um, she was a surgeon. And um, she was on a boating trip you know, in uh, South America and got, went over in her canoe and got buried in under the uh, waterfall um, for, I think it was something like well over 20 some minutes. And finally, you know, she was in the little like canoe that you're strapped in. Her, she could perceive that both knees um, were broken, you know, backwards. And she floated out and floated downstream and had this very, very lucid experience and was told she did not want to come back even though she adored her husband, loved her children, but they explained to her her time was not yet, something being she encountered, and she went back. But it was one of the most well-documented cases. Uh, and you know, you could say, well, these are stories, uh, apocryphal, and you could dismiss maybe some of the things that you heard from Nancy today. But what's interesting is when, you, when you're with more and more people who report such similar things, I would never ask anybody to believe anything, you know, just because I think it's true. But um, I, I very much believe that consciousness comes from someplace and continues. And the great thing is that we don't have to have the same body, I think, forever, you know. Um, but that's just, you know, my opinion. We have more questions? Uh, 
Hi, um, thank you for... Actually, oh, uh, could you hold for, off for a second? Because I did, did want to address your question. Because um, I believe what you asked was um, correct. Should you be afraid of death? Was that essentially your question you were asking? Because I was going to, at first, just affirm, yes, you know, I, I'm afraid of death. I mean, and so therefore I think that what happens oftentimes when we think of death is it comes to, again, one of those core mysteries of a very logical question. What happens after death? We know a material explanation of what happens after death. Our bodies decay. Is that the end? Or is there more? Oftentimes when I would teach at the high school level, every year, every time my students would ask questions about the afterlife, they would always ask, Father, how can we believe in the resurrection if our bodies decay? If our bodies are decayed, what is being resurrected? And from a Christian perspective, and I can't speak for the other members of the, the board's faith background, but from a Christian perspective, we have to remember that when scripture speaks of resurrection, it doesn't speak of resuscitation. As I would tell my students, it's not night of the living dead, you know, in terms of corpses coming out of the ground. It's being given a glorified body. That is what scripture speaks of, a new reality. And in Revelation, for example, the speak of the, of the talk of the new heavens and the new earth. Um, we're, we're material creatures. We live in a material realm, so it is the very normal tendency for us to rush to a material explanation of which we consciously are aware of now to explain those things. But scripture is very clear. This is something radically different. And so to be given a glorified body is a resurrection, not a resuscitation. So along with being afraid of death, there also should be a little bit of excitement and exhilaration of what is that journey? What is the journey of which that will be? And how can we see that from a standpoint of this life being lived in preparation for that journey versus this life being lived in a way that dreads that journey? Now, we can get into much more theological questions in terms of how do we understand our moral life, how do we, you know, all those type of things, but that would be my starting point. And you also are allowed to live a, a joyous and emotionally rich life and not believe in an afterlife. That, that's not part of my life. I think I die and I decay and that is the end. And I, I cry and I, I miss the people who I loved who've passed. And like I said, there's a, a bit of me that takes some comfort in the idea that time may be a wholeness. I don't think I exist any other time that I'm alive. I think you know the time after I'm dead is the same as the time before I was born. These are just areas of time that I didn't exist in, but it's possible that tiny little bit of time I exist in is, is part of the universe forever. So I, I sort of think of myself as maybe limited but eternal. I only get this life, that's it. But this life is part of a much larger whole. It's not an ego-based thing. I don't think my intelligence continues. I, I think that I get this one little chance. And to me, that means you, you curate your life and, and you, you absolutely help each other. I mean, I don't understand as we're dying why we don't comfort each other more, why we're not all hugging each other and really helping each other to deal with the fact that we're ceasing to exist. I, 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 want, I want a big cuddle pile. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a primate. I, 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 I could deal with the loneliness of the universe and the scale of the universe a lot better if I'm holding somebody's hand. I, I, really, I really need that. Okay, well, I guess I'll weigh in on this one, too, then. <laughs> um, I would say that I believed very much like how what you believed, and that because of my exploration into the realms that I've explored, my work, for example, as a trained psychic detective, I was apprenticed for a decade to a well-known psychic detective. What do we work on? Well, mostly missing person cases, and most of those are homicide cases. You're connecting with victims. All of a sudden, you're getting information from the victims. Um, I just uh, worked on a case a couple of days ago uh, for a client who um, operates a very large ski resort where uh, uh, one of their employees just went missing. And I got all kinds of data because I experienced being with his spirit, because I think he's gone. 
but he gave me, and I was able to verify a lot of that data. I have, in, in the years I've been doing this, I have seen spirits of the deceased with my physical eyes. I have felt them physically on my skin. I have smelled them with my physical olfactory nose system. I mean, stuff that I never in a million years would have thought because I didn't believe it. And, and I think if you open yourself to the idea that there is a absolutely a form of continuation and there is a, a communication that goes on, um, but what we do, and I have written about this before, we our five senses completely, they're like the, the, the gross, large uh, sensory system that we possess. They start blocking all of our finer sensing mechanisms. If you learn how to make them, those, those large systems, be quiet for a bit so you can tune in, you start picking up huge amounts of data about the about humans who have been long gone, but they are somehow still here. I don't want to die. I love living. I absolutely adore living. But I do think that there's a cohesive... And by the way, I interviewed uh, Dr. Alexander before he got famous, after he'd had his near-death experience. And... Uh, I, I, in the course of being a, a radio show host, I have interviewed people who've died once, twice, three times, four times, even five times. And they have experiences that defy anything you can believe. It, once you start doing remote viewing, you start realizing you operate as a point of consciousness everywhere in all space time. And then once you can realize that you can operate that way and you're really not dealing with your physical 3D body, then it becomes at least possible, possible that you can survive death. Well, regarding to my experience, I seen in the moment, in that moment, we are all heroes. Or we could be heroes. As regarding to you were describing my experience in the Equatorian Amazon jungle, 10 years ago, what uh, I took almost 20 years to get to the target to work. The target was exploring these, uh, these caves. A friend of mine was the discoverer of this kind of uh, leg legendary uh, lost golden library for ancient times. And the area was very protected. I grew up with the story. But always was so many conflicts to get there. And for me, it's after I was trying, after not so many years, but uh, I was waiting, and I spent six months to get to the target when I was between the jungle and the city. And the area well, is, is very kind of, uh, was a hot zone uh, between uh, the destruction of the environment by the mining companies, the aboriginals, the Indians were very kind of uh, picky who was coming, and I, I have all the permission, all the things, but I have a guide who hated. And f suddenly, well, uh, after leaving the caves, uh, was a, a lady come to intercept us. I said, they are looking for your party. I was with the special forces of Ecuador who were expert in descending and climbing. And this is a very long shaft. It's a complicated uh, cave system. And in the moment, they said, well, let's decide. I don't want any kind of uh, blood spill in my consciousness, let's, let's hide. And we hide in a hut. They come around, it was night, uh, they shoot in the air. Uh, we discovered later they were very drunk. This was 10 henchmen against four. And my party was have kind of weapons, and I said no. And we hide in this hut next to a family. I said, I don't want any uh, complication. I said, I didn't think in myself in that moment and I think in that moment, sometimes, many times, the spiritual forces come to, to your help, and we have to hide overnight. And during the night, we were in a very close, kind of close uh, uh, hut uh, coming, and, and the special forces were very upset with me, and one of them, they started to hit me. And I said, well, if I'm not being killed by the Indians, I'm killing by my own <laughs> troop. But I was totally prepared for the transition if that happened. But I was praying, please don't 
don't hurt the, the families around. I was okay, totally okay. And finally, well, in the same moment, my, my wife of that time, she was praying to uh, in a statue. I used to go to meditate and pray it in, in the town I was living in that time. Uh, and a statue who is, his, her feet is st stepping on the serpent. And in the same time also, yeah, I was praying uh, about uh, uh, a priest who was connected to this place who was um, in the process uh, to be canonized, the Father Crespi, Carlo Crespi, um, who was related to this kind of lost thing. So there were many conversions. I think what we have in, in, in that moment, it's, it's very special. It's, a, it's not a special, it's a, it's, I think it's a unique, unique experience and always different. Um, only in one in the lifetime. We have a couple questions over here. My name is Ethan. Thank you all for being here. Um, Elon Musk thinks that we live in a simulation. My understanding of the line of thinking is that we've seen pretty impressive improvements in technology in our lifetimes, that simulated realities are becoming more and more realistic. And if we believe that it's possible that an environment could be created that is a simulated environment, but that is so immersive, so realistic, that we might not be able to distinguish it from real life, if we believe that that is possible, then there are two options. One is that we will be the first to invent such a thing, and the second is that somebody's already invented it and we are living in their simulation. Your thoughts? <laughs> I'll grab it first, just because, yes, I've heard that before. One of my favorite movies is The Matrix. So, I do. I think that's possible. Yes, in fact, uh, that was already discussed at a UFO conference where I just was a couple of weeks ago. Um, they brought up that exact same issue, and they already suggested that advanced intelligences have created us as whatever you know, androids or whatever. And if you want to call this a simulated experience, maybe it is. If you want to take it on a religious sense, yeah, we've already been created. So this is. Whatever this experience is, I mean, it's sim what, does that, what does that even mean, simulated? Simulated by who, compared to what? So I'm not sure that that, I don't know that that pulls the conversation further, that's just my feeling. The thing that I love about that is how, how that, that idea goes all the way back to Rene Descartes, and he was just the first person that wrote it down, so that would have been in, in the early 1700s. He wrote about what if there was an evil genius that could manipulate every aspect of our experience and we weren't aware of it. I mean, I love science fiction. I love The Matrix. I mean, I think that was a great film. Um, the, 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 the question you, you, you run up against is, you know, it, it, it's a cool idea, right? It's a, it's a neat idea. It makes great science fiction. But then what? I mean, if there's no way to prove it or disprove it, where do you go from there? And, and it's one of the, I mean, I, I know Elon Musk, I, he, he doesn't like go around saying none of this is real. I mean, it's a really interesting science fiction idea. It's a really interesting philosophical idea that people have been dealing with for hundreds of years. To me, the question is where do you go if you can't prove any aspect of that? I, I, it sort of, to me, becomes kind of a dead end of an idea if there's nothing else to do. And these are much better answers than I'm gonna give you, but. It, when you were speaking, it reminded me of a presentation that I heard of Brother Guy, Consul Magno, uh, that he gave at the University of Arizona. It was a seven-part series of which he had one, exploring the question from different perspectives, what is the definition of life? How do you understand life? And in his presentation, he went through how, depending on what was in modern times, the science of the times, that suddenly became integral to defining life. So for when you had the, the self-actualization you know, theories of the day. Life was about self-actualization. Um, for the data age, life was about the accumulation and processing of data. 
And then as he pointed out in the presentation, by the way, what is data? <laughs> you know, we use that word all the time. What is data? And he kind of went through and showed how when we have technological moves, that in almost intuitively becomes something that we try to assimilate to our understanding of what is life. So therefore, in an age of artificial intelligence and uh, virtual reality, why wouldn't we then you know, think in terms of, oh, well, maybe life is just a virtual life or a parallel life. I'm not giving your, your question the, the precision it needs. But it shows that at the end of that presentation and at the end of all seven presentations, the answer to the, that came about of how do you define life was we know it when we see it. And that wasn't just from Brother Guy, that was from all the other perspectives too. And as a priest, I can't mention the other field of which we use that definition for to identify it as. So, but, uh, um, but anyway, I just, along with that, I just had that you know, idea that you know, a lot of that is that we're, whatever our sense of advancement is, we want to incorporate that into us. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just we can't make that the only thing. We have to have a, a sense of, of deeper exploration constantly. We got one more. Okay, hi, I'm Melinda. I have to confess, I, I haven't heard all of the seven speakers, but um, I'm struck with the, the kind of overall construction of this event. Um, essentially, uh, there being two visions of heaven um, and a kind of positioning of the spiritual versus the scientific, but it always hasn't been the case. And so, you know, for instance, mystics constantly questioning, you know, the premises in religion. There are scientists who can be religious um, and so on and so forth. So uh, my question is for really each one of you, um, where, where do you find that, that line that challenges the, the side of the aisle that you're on, or do you? Thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, for, you know, I was trying to explain to these groups of scientists, so I seem to be speaking with, um, that, you know, I actually, the, I think the way that I got one of them really annoyed was that I had questioned, he, he had challenged me and I said, oh, have, is that because of your global religious belief system? And that bugged him and he, he wrote about it several times. And it was good because, I mean, I believe that whether we're talking about, you know, spiritual systems, which includes, as I believe, you know, more formal religious types of beliefs or more uh, what get categorized as more occult types of beliefs, all of that, that is, I mean, when they talk, today's, today's uh, magic is, is, is tomorrow's science. I mean, it's just, it, it's all the same thing. I, so I don't put up any dividing lines. What annoys me constantly is that people do divide it up and people lose interest because, as I mentioned in, in my uh, presentation, if you don't have your personal experience with it, it literally, I mean literally, not just metaphorically, does not exist because it can't enter into your sensory system and, and therefore into your brain system and, and your intellectual system, which is why I have spent many, many years trying to convince uh, academics and other people to just open their minds to the concepts. Just, just to the, you don't have to believe it, you don't have to accept it, just use it as a hypothesis. But for me, it's all part of the same system. I don't see a difference. Um, yeah, because I think most of this conference was you know, seeing more of an overlap in general. But if you want to read an excellent book, there's The Mind of God by Gerald Schroeder, who now lives in Israel, but he is an American scientist. And it's something that I know Father James has in his library as well. Um, we were talking about that over dinner, right? You're looking blank? You do, right? Okay. 
<laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I was thinking, did I dream that? You know. Um, the other thing is, I've been privileged to help deliver babies. I used to deliver, uh, help deliver babies in Mexico, and I've also been very honored to be with. I think it's nine or ten people now, uh, when they passed over, when they when they died, and I have to say, for me, the energy of when a baby takes its first breath, and when a, an, a person gives up their last breath, the exhalation, it's very similar. And I've talked to other people who are in nursing, and they'll go, oh my gosh, that's so true. I think so too. You know, like it's really interesting when, when you bring that up. There's something, it's like a, a, a gateway. Very similar energy. I recommend a book called The Simulations of God, of John Lilly. Simulations of God. We were talking using the word simulation, too. And he was seeing the future, how we are going to be in the age of turning ourselves computers. But regarding what to the supernatural, and regarding to the kind of the mission we have all, is when you start to research and exploring the field, all the type of phenomena, you see is, uh, the universe is a kind of a constant producing this type of phenomena in connection with our mind. And the expansion is, is unlimited. I was, in the beginning, I was a skeptic. I was more a science fiction writer. When I started to visit places where the people have contact with UFOs, extraterrestrials, um, places of uh, Marian apparitions, uh, old parapsychological phenomena. We think this continuum is is in us, as in it outside of us, and um, but exist. It's not a kind of a virtual thing. We have time for uh, three more questions. Um, next one is right here in the middle of the room. I, I guess some people still wanted to comment on that last question, if we can oh, go quickly, okay. but then we'll, then we'll, we'll do that, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that quickly, then I'll, I'll stand up to, uh, to Father James. So um, it's always kind of funny when they invite scientists to something like this, because one of the things we're really aware of is that science is a limited thing, right? The whole idea of science is can you design an experiment to prove something is right or wrong? And the idea is that everybody in the world, if you write your scientific paper properly, I'm talking the physical scientists here. You know, if, if I tell you where I pointed the Hubble Space Telescope, how long I made the exposure, and which instruments I used, you should be able to do the exact same thing and come up with the exact same observation. I mean, there may be, you know, maybe a star died in the meantime, or there's some variation. Um, I'm not offering it as a spiritual um, solution. You know, I, I live inside a human mind and a human heart, and, and I have in my psychology, I, and I believe that's what it is, uh, a need to worship and a need for mystery. And, you know, I, I, I dance in the woods and I, I like to th think about fairies. And, I mean, there's many parts of my life that are irrational in the sense that they don't match science. Um, I find that's what it means to live inside a human brain. You know, our human brains have these experiences that we can't explain and, and these things that we, you know, can't put into words. And, and those, as we say, those are subjective experiences. I can't share a spiritual experience with you directly. You weren't there when I was having it. You weren't in my mind. You have up here a diversity of human experience. And, and that's, I think, where, you know, you come down to that underlying core of respect. Right? We don't all see the universe the same way. We're not experiencing it the same way. That's fine. I do separate science as a tool, the physical sciences. You know, the reason we cannot answer questions is because if we can't form an experiment, somebody had a great question, you know, do those 11 dimensions really exist? And the answer is we don't know yet. Mathematically, we need the 11 dimensions to get quantum mechanics to work. We know that. It works really well. makes great predictions. Are there really 11 dimensions in space is something we don't have proof of yet. So I need to put that on the shelf with a grain of salt and say that's a really cool idea, but we haven't designed an experiment yet. So I don't offer science as a spiritual solution. I'm a human being like everyone else. And you're seeing here a range of human experience. And quickly, since we have a couple more questions, when I was a child, heaven was a place I went to. It was, it was something that I waited for. As I'm getting older, 
I'm embracing less of that idea and more of heaven is something that you and I enter in right now, that you and I can experience if we see each other as the most important person in each other's life at that moment, because this is the only people we can be present to at this moment. That can give us a template of lived reality that potentially could prepare us for an eternal reality. And so for me, I find more and more, when I think about heaven as a Catholic priest, I think of it less as a far off, hopeful, I'm gonna win the eternal lottery type of thing that oftentimes people think of. And I try to have it be much more of a, I can actually live part of this now. I can't live the totality of it now. And part of it is you and me right now in terms of how we're interacting in this discussion and how our lives have interwoven at this point. Hey, we have a question in the back. Hi, I'm Ann, and my question's for Father James. Where are you? Oh, over there. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know how the church's position on the ascension mm -hmm. and where Jesus and the Blessed Mother ascended to. Yeah, great question. Because in the old metaphysics, we have up and down. <laughs> um, and that ironically, in just a, a quick side tangent, Sometimes people will often quickly point to the idea, oh, as, as uh, Christians, you used to believe that the earth was the center of the universe. Well, that's not necessarily inaccurate, but actually that earth was the bottom of creation. Because if you went down, 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 what do you have when you drill deep enough? Lava. <laughs> and where do things that deal with lava go? You know, so it's, it, uh, you know, it's much more of a up-down thing than a what's in the center type of a thing. So the ascension, um, what is that uh, idea? To be quite frank, I don't know. Um, I'm not, I can't definitively say to you, I wasn't there. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you what the ascension of Jesus was like. I can't tell you what the assumption of Mary was like either. Um, all I know that both of those realities that we speak of as Christians point to our hope of eternal salvation and the hope of our bodily, resurrect, uh, bodily, resu bodily resurrection, not the fear of condemnation, but the hope of etern eternal joy. And that's where for me the, that kind of, and again, we'd have to have a big long discussion about morality and all that kind of stuff, but just for the sake of brevity, can we live life in a way that excites us for a journey that could occur at death instead of fearing a journey that could occur at death? And how does that impact how we live our lives now? Um, and how do we treat one another in that space? Do we want to create a scrup scrupulosity of constantly being terrified of doing something wrong? Or do we want to live a life of passion and zeal saying, I want to love you and everybody here as well as I can right now because that's going to give my life meaning at this point and could also open up my heart to a reality beyond the immediate. Next question is here in the middle. Hi, thanks. Uh, so I'm a scientist, and um, I think a lot about the dichotomy of spirituality and science. And ever since I saw the exhibit that's at the museum right now, I've been wondering if maybe that limits us, like the way you know, science is limited, it's, there's a certain method. And I mean, are there ways maybe that we could kind of um, modify the method to integrate these two to really kind of advance our knowledge of the world farther? Um, I think it's very promising right now that so much research is being done by serious uh, particularly quantum physicists in the field of consciousness because I think once you, s and they're really struggling with this one, oh my goodness, I've watched them, you know, spin their wheels now, uh, but they're really, really working at it to try and find a material uh, basis by which to describe how it is that we are self-aware and therefore know that stuff called maybe data Thank you. 
Um, this is really interesting. Do you know the work of Christoph Koch? Okay, he's the big guy that, um, he, uh, you, do you know his work as well, no? Okay, on free will. He's a neurophysiologist. He worked with uh, Watson and Crick early on, just a real kind of genius. You can look up his, his work, but his work in, a, in a, like a second thing is that he found out that, let's say I, I in a, like a minute from now, I'm gonna like drop my keys, okay? And I'm gonna go with my right hand, go to pick them up. That before, just before my keys have even dropped and I have that impulse to go pick them up, that all the neurons are firing in the muscles needed for my right arm to lean over and pick it up. And uh, this is like over and over again, uh, looked at about free will, whether there's like what we think, oh, I made the decision to do that. It, it kind of upends that to say that maybe there's a, our consciousness before what we think of ourselves making a decision, making a decision that is actually, that we are kind of our own puppets in a way. It, it, it's a very interesting, so I think that speaks to some of the kind of really fascinating studies because we did not have the instrumentation to be able to even record that kind of micro, uh, you know, firing in the the neurons before. Now we do, and I I'm very excited. Um, you know, uh, you know how we that for a while rational life kind of made fun of people thinking um, that that there was uh, living beings in trees, etc. How many of you have heard about the secret life of trees? the new film and study, okay? And it turns out that, that trees are so much more awake and alive uh, to each other's needs, and they've really been able to track that, like, um, you know, like sending just the right minerals from their roots to a little tree over there dying and getting out of the way of the sunlight, literally moving themselves so another tree can grow up. It's, it's really fascinating now. Um, I remember I was close with uh, Christopher Bird who wrote The Secret Life of Plants. And he was a big CIA guy, quite frankly, one of the most brilliant people I've ever come across. But he um, uh, talked about Cleve Baxter. Do you know that research? Uh, uh, Cleve Baxter uh, well, kind of was the father of uh, the lie detector, that we, the modern lie detector. But uh, Cleve was always experimenting, as is the want of great you know, scientific minds. And he found that in an apartment where there had been a murder, there were plants. And so he hooked up the, his fine instrumentation that he was using on humans on plants. And he got the police to uh, agree to, one by one, take any of the, the people who were in the realm of possibility of being the murderer to go through in front of those plants. And nobody else knew what was going on. And uh, you know the plant like kind of ignored everybody and then freaked out on the meter when this one person walked in. And later, that was found by hard evidence, scientific evidence, that was the guy who murdered, you know. So it's, it's a wonderful time that we live in. Um, you know, it's so funny. A lot of us are skeptical when people perceive things that we don't. And yet, all of us have dogs that we know hear real sounds, not imaginary sounds, that we just can't. And we go, what is it, boy? You know, like he's going to tell us, you know. We know like they're picking up stuff. But now we're training those dogs to be helpers so that they can perceive epileptic fits, for example, coming on well before the, the, the experiencer, who should have a track record of like kind of what they feel like before they have a full-fledged, you know, epileptic fit or something, can even perceive it. What I found really interesting were some of the helper dogs for young epileptics who would go to school with them. When the child would get stabilized on meds, they stopped having the helper dog go to school with that child. But there, there were some very interesting reports that, uh, that when the child would have an, kind of an unexpected seizure, they thought they had stabilized them, in school, like seven miles away from where the dog would be, the dog would freak out in the parent's home knowing like having that psychic connection that, you know, and you're shaking your heads, yeah, you know, uh, that goes beyond physical space. Now, what I think is it, 
that, that we will understand more how that can be, that we will actually come up with scientific language of how these subtler forces actually work. And that's, you know, it's such a wonderful time to be in. We have, we have one more question over here on the, on the far, far right. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I, If I, if I could, if I could just respond to you really, really quick from a, a priest perspective, um, the thing that I found when I started to explore faith and science more from being open to science and radically open to science and placing myself in the limits, in a real way that actually deepened my faith. And a, a quick example of that, um, Bob Berman one time was interviewing me on a, a, a slew broadcast for an astronomy special and we were talking about time. And he was talking about how that uh, modern physics probably thinks that time is more of, a, of, a, of an illusion based on decay, and that what, we're, what really time is is a measurement of decay. Lo and behold, I'm reading St. Augustine one day, and he talks about how, you know what, I don't think time is what we perceive it to be. I think time is just a measurement of change. And that's something that I've read probably five or six times before for my seminary studies in Augustine. But allowing myself to be open to the scientific ex exploration suddenly gave me insight of what Augustine was talking about. So actually, I would say that from my experience, putting myself as a person of faith inside the box and inside the limits has actually deepened my faith. Uh, I'm over here. Question, a uh, little context, I'm an urban pastor focusing on an urban context, primarily uh, black and brown people, as well as a, uh, a school principal. And as I listen to you on a wonderful presentation, and thank you, I'm seeing how do I make this practical and meaning meaningful to my audience. One such way I know is by, uh, for young people, emphasizing and explaining the big idea behind the periodic table of elements. So chemicals and uh, physical science become real in this context. There was a comment made about how elements are constantly being discovered. Can you expound more on that and explain and correlate that with how we can make this, all these ideas more meaningful in a context where people who are disempowered and disinterested? Absolutely. I, I know, I mean, one of the things that I really took away from learning where all the chemical elements come from is the commonality of everyone on the planet, right? And, you know, the, the idea that, that nobody owns that story more than anybody else. There's no population, there's no person. You know, you, whether you're rich and famous or, or whether you're, you know, an anonymous person, you know, dying in the streets of India somewhere. I mean, I mean, everybody is part of that story. You own it the same amount. And to me, that has... Um, a tremendous call underneath it for social change. Um, the, the, the talent that we have wasted, you know, as I mentioned, every person opening their eyes is completely unique. The universe will never have you again. And when you think about how many of those experiences have been ruined, suppressed, made horrible, you know, how many people with the brain of Einstein, you know, died picking cotton hundreds of years ago, and how many people are dying in Syria right now, the, the, the universe is, belongs to everybody absolutely equally. The, no one can take that away from you. The reason your blood is red is because of the element of iron in it. That's why we need our spinach, it's got iron in it. Um, iron is specifically the chemical that stars make before they explode. They, they actually, if things go slow and you know, stars live for millions or billions of years, but when the core of a star tries to fuse the element iron, it dies within a quarter of a second, like that. All the iron in your blood happened at that instant when a giant star died. We, we, we all bleed red, you know? And, and so to me, there, there's an underlying call, you know, that if everybody is uniquely the universe knowing itself, it's up to us as a species to curate those experiences, to make those existences worth something. You know, we, we, everybody is intrinsically the most important person that ever existed. Every single person. Oh. 
you see me getting nervous up here because I, I got a pack on my flight to Iceland. I told my husband I'd be home, so I'm going to have to <laughs> Okay, <laughs> to sneak last out at question. some point. Last question up front here. Um, actually, I think you just kind of answered it. I, the reason why I came here was because I feel like there is something really, really lacking in um, on Earth right now. And I feel this sense of foreboding that, you know, the climate change and and how destructive we are and the threat of nuclear bombs and all of these things, I feel like there is no future for us and our children and our grandchildren. And I like what you said, I and I agree, and how, you know, I don't know how we can move that forward, but um, that gives me hope, and I thank you. That's the first step, right, the hope. <laughs> I was going to say in that culture of fear that's very prominent these days, um, the joking answer that has a hint of truth is stop watching CNN or Fox News. <laughs> that's step one. <laughs> and, um, and, and step two is engage the journey and the joy of life. Um, I oftentimes when I do spiritual direction talk with my directees about your sphere of influence versus your sphere of concern. Our sphere of concern can be wildly huge. I'm concerned about things going on in North Korea and Russia, and that's a sphere of concern of mine. What's my sphere of influence in that? Very little, if anything. But what I do have in my sphere of influence is that I can try to be the best person I can for you today, and in that I have to trust that there's something enough in that, that if enough of us do that, we can flip a culture of fear to a, a culture of optimism.